Welcome everyone, to those who are here, to those who are joining by Zoom. This is um, this is uh, our weekly call of autonomy, which is a meeting for people working at the coastal lab. And there are days like today when we make this meeting uh, public, when there is a when there is a good reason to do it. And this is this is a this is a very good reason we have. With us, um, George Davy Smith, who is the director of the FRC Interactive Epidemiology Unit and a professor at University of Bristol, someone that all of, all of you know well. And um, like in any other protocol circle, we hope that there will be discussion and debate after after this, and we are looking forward to it. So, George. Thanks very much, and thanks um, very much indeed for the uh, invite. So I'm going to briefly outline pre registered pre registered triangulation of uh, evidence, and um, as you see from the outline, I'm going to go at uh, a fair speed and not cover in great detail uh, many aspects of it. And I did start. I'll, I'll finish thirty-five minutes after uh, I start speaking, so I hope you'll be kind for discussion. So firstly, why would one want to consider triangulation of evidence? Well, obviously there is a large amount of epidemiological data that get published which are non-informative. Here's a very good example of that. This is my first, first sort of paper published when I was 30 on the cholesterol concentration of brain tumours, thinking that, that maybe some soluble carcinogen uh, was activated through this sort of process. Uh, this paper was uh, peppered with uh, was not significantly, was significantly terrible use of arbitrary uh, thresholds. Uh, and uh, my sixth first of the paper was a failure to replicate uh, this study um, uh, in the back of the of the Now, my, my, um, this example and many other examples of the uh, useful results that I've published uh, didn't have any impact. But uh, here's a finding which had a vast impact. Uh, this is a finding from the Health Professionals Follow-up Study published in the New England Journal of Medicine about vitamin E supplement use and the risk of coronary heart disease. And it appeared that using vitamin E supplements reduced coronary heart disease risk by 40%. There was a parallel replication from the Nurses Health Study published in the same issue of the New England Journal of Medicine. And the New York Times splashed this on a major headline, vitamin E greatly reduces the risk of heart disease studies suggest. Uh, taking vitamin E just for two to four years, taking the supplement for two to four years, uh, produced this 40% reduction in risk. And note that here, there's, there's no difference between what is being studied observationally, which is taking vitamin E supplements, putting them in your hand, drinking, swallowing them down, taking them for two to four years. This is precisely what was tested in the randomized controlled trials that randomized people to taking supplements. This was influential and impactful epidemiological research. This led to a, a, a rapid increase in the use of uh, vitamin E cont containing multivitamins and vitamin E on its own. In the studies in which it was performed, the Nurses Health Study, you see here this huge takeoff in vitamin E supplement use after that vastly publicized uh, study. Uh, this is showing that non smokers still had a small difference to smokers. Uh, but overall, this is a rapid increase, and up to nearly 60% of the people in the health professionals follow-up study took them 40 to, were taking vitamin E. I uh, truncated these data uh, at 1998 because this is when the trials started to appear. The randomized control trial showing very robustly that taking vitamin E supplements for around four years had no impact uh, on coronary heart disease. Vitamin E supplement use declined uh, in, in the nurses' health study and in the health professionals' uh, study because, of course, these people were informed about the results and were, of course, people very interested in this finding. Sadly, the population as a whole, it, just take, it took much longer for vitamin E supplementation use to decline. And uh, a similar story was seen with beta carotene. In this case, the studies were, were two observational studies reported only as... Um, uh, as abstracts from the nurses' health study and the health professionals' follow-up study, showing that beta-carotene 
that have the, the, the same large parent protective effect uh, on, uh, on uh, coronary heart disease and some other conditions. Beta carotene use sumped up. There was also a, a, a non pre specified uh, endpoint report from a preliminary analysis of a pilot for a randomized trial which suggested benefit within the health professionals. Uh, a study, uh, I'd say bit, bit of character went up and then declined. Uh, in this case, for rather um, less happy reasons in a way, in that the randomized trials there show actually increased, of anything, increased uh, uh, events in people taking the taking supplementation. And vitamin A use didn't go up uh, because, it, because retinal studies had appeared earlier long before uh, any uh, observational data suggested uh, benefit. But that was the impactful results of ethnological studies indicating that we need to have some other way of evaluating uh, evidence. So I'm going to move to the variety of evidence thesis. This is based on the notion that the volume of data generated from similarly biased sources asymptotes very rapidly in its value. And you can see this in the, the meta-analyses here as a male, and this is the uh, character data of male health workers, being the people who you know, showing uh, lower risks of uh, common cardiovascular mortality uh, in people with uh, greater intake of beta carotene. And then here's the randomized, uh, randomized trials. But you see, just repeating similarly biased observational studies is, is worthless, and in some ways worse than worthless, because it seems to it gives falsely, it gives the impression. Uh, of uh, strength of evidence. So the variety of evidence thesis suggests that you involve different methods and domains of data. That is what is here. And that you need to have the intuitive and formal demonstration of the independence of direction and magnitude of biases across study designs. This is something I will move on to. But that is what really strengthens evidence, is when is when the evidence sources are different, they're using different methods, and the biases uh, would be uh, diff different. And establishing mechanisms of the exposures and outcomes, sometimes known as the Russell Williamson thesis, uh, adds to this evidence. And obviously, quantification also adds to the evidence, but is not essential. If you want a beautiful example of causal evidence in epidemiology, Theobald Smith, 1893 report on cattle fever is just absolutely wonderful. So examples of the variety of evidence you can utilize in this approach are your observational studies, maybe uh, the weakest form, target trials, which uh, you, you will all know a large amount about, cross-context comparisons when the confounding structure can be demonstrated to be different in, 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 different, in different studies. For example, doing studies in low and high income countries on, on breastfeeding, where the confounding is very different in the two places. Negative control studies, which again, you will know of, with incipient studies to take into account potential shared environmental factors in youth. Children and twin studies, the uh, Medina randomization, which you may know. You can use genetics also to estimate confounding, not simply as in Mandela randomization when you're using this uh, as a way of understanding phenotypic causality. You can use it, you can use Mandela, you can use genetics to say how much confounding is there, because confounding is a causal concept, and you can demonstrate how confounders actually influence both the exposure and outcome. You can you can see whether the extent of confounding. Uh, is what you, it, it, it is, we could account for the observations you see. And there's non genetic uh, instrumental variables and there's randomized controlled trials. Now, all of, the, all of these approaches bar target trials and genetics to estimate confounding. As far as I know, I don't know if those, those two studies have been used for looking at maternal smoking and birth weight of offspring. But in a paper with Nancy Creed, we did bring this example of what you can get evidence from all these different approaches and all the references to the sources of evidence uh, on, that, on that. So you can use, in many circumstances, you can use a very wide range of different sources of evidence. As I say, independence of bias is crucial. So now the direction and magnitude of an effect from the first studies of design will not predict the direction and magnitude of the effect from the, the companion or comparison study design, net of the effect of the exposure and the investigation, the performing definition of this. 
So obviously, if the exposure under investigation has a cause or effect on the outcome, then the extent to which, say, your genetic variants in Mendelian randomization, or say, your uh, statin, uh, your drug in a randomized controlled trial, or say, what your predicted use is in the target trial, or whatever, they should not, they will not be, uh, they will, will produce an effect which relates to the exposure, but the effects net of that exposure should, well, will not, if they do not relate, and that is what one wants to have in defense of, of bias. So this can be demonstrated. So formal mediation analysis can be used to demonstrate the independence of biases. So what, what about evidence synthesis in this framework? So again, you know better, all of you know better than I do, and could explain better than I do an estimate framework, but this, would, this, is, this is what will be used for evidence synthesis. Sometimes studies will allow more than one uh, estimand uh, to be made. You can scale estimands uh, where, where, where the approaches are, are identifying different estimands. You can often have reasonable scaling for them. Here is an example of the scaling of estimands for four different comparisons of genetic instruments that relate to a gene which the drug influences. And the drug when randomized controlled trials of these drugs have been done, uh, drug treatment uh, for a lowering APOB carrying that protein is lowering the early on the uh, essentially. And what you see here is, sorry, what you see here, back to it, yeah, what you see here is what you see in the drug trials. Now, of course, the drug trials are randomized in people for, say, five years, so you're getting five-year difference in cholesterol level, usually in late middle age when you are uh, put into the drug trial. The genetic variants relate to cholesterol, differences in cholesterol across life, and a large number of studies have looked at genetic variants in relation to cholesterol, unlike the cord blood when the people are born, five-year-olds, and then, you know, and then you know, through, through growth in Alsbach and other cohort studies, and then through early adulthood. And you show that for most of them, they, the basic relative difference is it's pretty stable. But, it, but for all of them, you can actually work out, you know, take data and actually work out the trajectory and understand the extent to which a genetic variant leads to a long term difference in cholesterol level across one's life course. And what one sees here is you get very, you get, yeah, sorry. You get the similar scaling uh, of the difference uh, that, that is just so biologically so obvious that you see the difference between five year lower uh, LDL cholesterol and a, li a lifetime difference when it's scaled uh, to the same sort of average effect, your average lifetime difference versus your sort of average, uh, in the average difference seen in the, run in the randomized trials. So there you have two estimates. And, the, and those, but those estimates are scalable, and if you scale them with, with one uh, completely separate set of data based on genetic variants related to CTP and CTP inhibitor, or genetic data related to neem pic c one like one protein and neem pic c one like one protein inhibitor, this is completely independent. The gene compass, the genes are completely independent, the drugs are completely different. Uh, but the scaling is the same. So, in, so you, can, you can actually work out when it is sensible to scale estimates from two different sources. And your synthesis is within the study types. The first thing to synthesize data within the study type and examination of the heterogeneity uh, um, within, the stu within the study type, the different st studies that contribute to that study type. And then you uh, um, model the within and between study type with the combination of heterogeneity between and within. Now, you can combine methods. The one piece of new data uh, I'm going to show, so I'll run through this um, in a few minutes. Uh, and here, I'm considering thinking about combining target trials with genetics. But you can combine many different approaches. But you, you can obviously, uh, you, know, you know, you can, um, you can use many different randomization with negative controls. So you have to set eye color as your negative control outcome which is you know, patterned by ancestry, but should not influence any modifiable, should not be influenced by modifiable exposure. So if your MR study suggests that 
uh, that smoking is influencing eye colour, then you know something is going wrong. So you can combine more than one of these causal influence approaches, and uh, I have a large catalogue of ways you can combine these. But let's think about combining um, genetics to understand the confounding. So, uh, so the, the target trials uh, of uh, statins uh, and statins and antihypertensives combined, those are the two. Um, those were looked at uh, as, uh, treatments, uh, as treatment strategies in the target trial conclusion is that when randomized trials aren't available or feasible, observational analyses can emulate a variety of target trials. Not, not reporting the results was the target trial of antihypertensive use against no antihypertensives. And in, in the discussion, it's pointed out that actually the target trial there yeah, it suggested that antihypertensive use was increasing death rate in the treatment group by 12 percent, which is obviously not what we see in randomized controlled trials. And um, and obviously in another trial, definitely you benchmark the result of the target trial against your randomized controlled trial, uh, if you then get some of other outcomes, if you can use the use the target trial for the other outcomes you'd like to show that it works for the outcomes you know. And uh, Miguel suggested recently in the New England Journal of Medicine that maybe the problem with antihypertensive therapy is that they're used almost exclusively by people with risk factors for the outcome. So, how can we use genetics to look at this? Well, of course, this is just a confounding question. Does cardiovascular risk actually increase the use because doctors actually do prescribe the drugs to that risk? Does it, do, does it change the use? more than statins. The, the, some, the suggestion here is that the special degree is confounded by indicator of antihypertensives. So you can look in UK Biobank and you can do a causal analysis of confounding because the, it's taken the drugs doesn't change your genotype. And if you use polygenic scores generated across the, across the uh, genome, and here we've used a range of cutoffs that doesn't make much difference, but use a P1.15 cutoff. Then all factors that influence CHD risk, including factors that we call confounders, get picked up in that in that score. Polygenic scores pick up, um, pick up all the, will pick up all the phenotypic confounders. If you do, if you when you do polygenic scores for vitamin D, for example, it relates to BMI education because BMI reduces your vitamin D, education increases your vitamin D, etc. You pick up every, you pick up the confounder. And you can use uh, obviously related instrumental variable methods for actually then uh, estimating the measurement error corrected confounding. But the, the uh, hypothesis we go forward is not supported by this in any way. The coronary heart disease score predicts statin use, uh, statin use more strongly than the than, than it does antihypertensive use. The so coronary heart disease risk is, is, having, is related in a stronger way to taking statins than it is to antihypertensives. And the reverse is true, and this is the beauty of genetics. <laughs> when you know things that you think you should see, you'll see. That's what happens. The reverse is true for stroke. Now we know that antihypertensives uh, will be given, uh, particularly people at home, very high blood pressure, at high risk of stroke. And indeed, that's what you see, because doctors know that they would be slightly more um, concerned in that sort of situation. Of course, if you combine those two the overall cardiovascular risk, it's the same. And you actually see that with phenotypic, um, the phenotypic distributions as well. So that, that, that's a way in which you can interrogate these, interrogate these things by combining two design types, which I think is very attractive. You need to combine two design types, etc. But I haven't got time to go through uh, an example of that. So next is I mentioned, you know, you want to use uh, non, you want to actually use data from other sources, such as you know, animal studies, etc. Not all useful evidence of the effects of exposure from human health comes from studies that can provide a useful estimate for human exposure. Animal studies, cell systems, detachable polycytes, interstitial fluids, etc., etc. Work on those things does uh, provide provides evidence. It could be science. Um, but, the, but the conventional approach to biological plausibility, perhaps that term being used in epidemiology because Bradford Hill, of course, used it uh, within his viewpoints, he never, never called it criteria, but within his viewpoints, um, uh, a, a sort of post hoc notion of biological plausibility is not helpful. In the uh, late 1980s, early 90s, I was working largely on um, uh, 
uh, HIV uh, and she was reading the literature and doing studies uh, about uh, transmission of, uh, of HIV. Uh, and uh, two papers came out pretty much at the same time about the co factors in male to female sex of transmission of human immunodeficiency virus. And the first paper suggested that, um, that all contraceptive use uh, uh, increased the susceptibility uh, to HIV infection, having a direct effect on genital mucosa, making it less susceptible virus to HIV. Have a immunosuppressive action, which will increase susceptibility to HIV. That sounds, you know, that sounds pretty plausible to me. The other paper found the reverse result. And this one suggested that all contraceptive use protects against HIV because it suggests you can contain more contraceptive thickened the life of mucus, which might be expected to hamper the entry of HIV, the disease, the gamut, etc. And they all had good references for all the biological, it's a, like the biological data. There has to be some other way of thinking about how you can uh, specify uh, those, those data. And there are you know, approaches uh, which I think have been used um, possibly too little. So far, we've explored too little in our field about the through dissertation prior in advance. But the point here to make is that the, the whole basis of this approach is that you have to pre register your protocol before. Results and have a protocol for all of the different methods, all the methods you're going to use, going to use has to be uh, registered. And quantification is useful up to the point where we start to harm it, but I think it might harm it when, because we can't, because some form of knowledge, some form of science isn't reducible to an estimate for an effect of a particular exposure on human health, we then say it's less valuable. That seems unlikely that the way the world is actually organized. <laughs> it is the, 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 the things you can actually make estimates for are actually more important uh, component of a biological approach because people we'll have disease and we can So I think we need to have some way of not using that as that, uh, that's a, that's a category for what is admissible. Uh, so there's an essential role of protocol development, pre registration, open access data and code in successful. Uh, triangulation of evidence. Here's a nice example of, of this, which is when the NHLBI um, uh, mandated uh, that there needed to be uh, you know, registration of what was going to be the primary uh, outcomes. And uh, you, you can actually date when that we know when that applied for, and you'll see that there is a uh, to disappear, the shift, the, the shift away from uh, from the massively beneficial study at the time where that administration um, uh, was, was introduced. So again, you'll know all these things better than I do, the problem of P hacking, uh, 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 testing, choosing results you like, there's the issue of hypothesizing after the results are known, uh, or, or harking, there's cognitive biases, I think cognitive biases are possibly the things which are um, the least understood and, and probably more, more important than I think people think they are. Everyone thinks about financial conflicts of interest, they're obvious, but there's also um, problems with biases and fee registration um, uh, could, could help there. So uh, I'm going to think again to go back to the static example, which I, um, I think public trials are incredibly valuable approach, and I think they've shown that in the uh, COVID um, uh, era. And uh, I've uh, looked uh, and very much admired the protocols which are now being posted for these, which I think is absolutely the way um, that, that, that has, to, uh, has to go. And so a pre registration uh, uh, in this case, which is with a couple of target trials, what's the status and survival, uh, then you know, benchmark them against, against uh, all cause mortality from trials, and one report. Uh, a, a result from one study was reported, which uh, showed no reduction in all cause mortality. In another report, which uh, uh, marked a different set of data, this time in the appropriate set of data, which is the cluster of treatment trials, uh, metronomic, I presume it was that one, which, um, which showed a which benefit. Now, both of these got stripped. So, but but uh, if, if you have a fully specified protocol, 
in advance, you would make the specification of where you would take that from. Now, it is of course true that the evidence changes because then you wouldn't want to say, because we've specified this, if knowledge advances, we'll still use which is a weaker result. At least it would be, it would be still not, not to use the updated data, obviously, make no sense at all. But you can pre specify where you would take those, those data from. So we will take this data from the latest cholesterol treatment trials, collaboration, meta-analysis, So um, that, that would be an example of uh, pre-specification. The next essential thing, uh, in my view, is open access to data. Open access data allows people to, to actually look for themselves and see if the bias that they think might have generated results uh, exists. And in 1994, stimulated by those vitamin E papers, they simply did not believe those papers when they came out. And then I discovered you could not get access to the data. The, the, the only the results of the cardiovascular disease reported, you know, if the results of some other outcomes had been reported with negative controls, we would have probably thought things different. I very much admire Diana Petiti's and now the hormone replacement therapy of dying in car crashes, showing that. Uh, uh, mortality of accidents and violence was automatically predicted just as well as the lower mortality from coming out with the lower mortality of accidents and violence. And that sort of thing I, I thought really needed to be done. And I just couldn't believe <laughs> that, 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 that they could be owned privately. But I wrote this editorial stimulated, uh, the BMJ stimulated by those two papers. At the end of which I said that. This is really cute, isn't it? Papers submitted to journals had to be accompanied by a bisque copy. That tells you how fucking old I am. But the data <laughs> on which they were based, and the physical record could check that the results were not the product of over enthusiastic data torture. In this way, the data could contribute to improving the quality of public research. And the fall in submissions to a journal brave enough to implement this policy would be a useful indicator of its success. Uh, the BMJ actually did debate. But the, the editor was actually quite enthusiastic to introduce this, but the rest of the editor would have to, wouldn't go with it. And uh, some journalists have um, moved on this line. But of course, we've been transformed with open access data uh, with studies like UK Biobank, Alstack, um, other which, pioneer, which sort of pioneered this. Uh, but sadly, some studies are uh, still not available uh, in that way. There have to be open source code. Because you know, again, the way one does the analysis can lead to, to different results, as we know from studies that have been done by the then data set of different people. So open out open source code is essential. And you need to pre-register, in my view, pre-register a detailed protocol. So that, as I say, that protocol doesn't have to specify exactly exactly we can <coughs> That's why you'll be used data to a particular point of time, but it needs to have what are objective discussions of and um, discussions of what will um, be used. And here's a not yet, not the level of detail I think required, but from uh, um, Marcus with uh, Hannah Salas, um, who just moved to the uh, IEU, but it's moved to Liverpool, uh, has done a fantastic job of putting together a protocol and open science framework. Um, for a, a triangulation uh, study. And there are, of course, many journals will allow uh, pre registered protocols now, an increasing number, he, Nature Human Behaviour does, etc. One of the sad things is some of those, for the journals, the journals don't won't post. And, and I think one of the very valuable things around pre registered data protocols is to get basically open source criticism, to get up, to get up not criticism, peer review, gentle. <laughs> Uh, explanation of difference of opinion, but actually to, to actually have that available public. So I think I think one wants to move to these um, these protocols being published uh, or being made, made available other than the open science framework where Hans put her uh, protocol um, and allows for that. And there's maybe the difference to some other approaches to putting the other um, you know uh, consensus views, if you like, is that this relate, the consensus here relates to what is the admissible evidence. So you don't make consent, you don't have consensus around the findings. You agree consensus in advance on what relates to admissible evidence, not on the findings. And there are, of course, uh, limitations. 
And uh, potential, uh, one limitation I think is obviously you can gain the system or park it in a pre-registration for the results are narrow. Now, the issue here is because you know you cannot uh, ultimately uh, a, a, a police and outlaw fraud you know, methods of fraud detection. But I think what should be made clear is that during that, this is equally as fraudulent as we make it later. So that should just become part of what is considered scientific practice. Instead of you actually, you know, it's, 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 it's that if you, uh, if, you behave, if you enter into that form of practice, then that's fraudulent. And what is so, what's so well known from the history of uh, celebrated scientific frauds, but also less celebrated ones, uh, is that if people start doing what they're more considered to be you know, lower down the level of, uh, of bad behaviour, move along that trajectory. So, but the system could be gained. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that there are no potential limitations and data will be made and discussed uh, without me um, uh, having to uh, use it at the time. So I'd just like to acknowledge uh, people I've spoken to and talked to and written about and worked with uh, on these uh, issues and the uh, public that they produce the data I share. This is um, some further reading. I'd just like to say please read the original function. Don't read what textbooks say about this functional criteria. Read the uh, original, his original uh, writing. Uh, and um, just in time to, to, for a new, new year presents, sadly not in time for Christmas, this, this will be out in Cold Spring Harbour. Um, this is a book on, uh, on translation of evidence, essentially for designs which use genetics and other designs and cause influence. So, uh, so, um, so the, 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 the different genetic approaches, but how you could combine those with other approaches. Uh, are covered in this book and it has this rather beautiful parochial uh, uh, on the yeah, cover. Uh, and uh, just to say that I am in Boston till the 10th of December, and that's my uh, email address. And if anyone uh, would like is interested in, in discussing triangulation, particularly if anyone thinking about maybe you know, thinking about putting in a pre registered protocol or, you know, or combining different designs. All the history of epidemiology, or maybe even randomization, or how to make social epidemiology matter, or how to make genetic epidemiology matter, or whatever, uh, just uh, uh, drop me an email. And uh, now we have uh, time for discussion. I've got to leave that. Yeah, thank you so much. There's so many really interesting points, and I'm sure that we will have a lot of interesting points. And I don't know where to start, but I have one of the recent points about data sharing uh, in, in the in, in epidemiology, we use more and more public databases, uh, healthcare records registered from the Scandinavian countries. And even when I think we have uh, we have a taking steps towards sharing code and being more transparent, on the other hand, I think we are going backwards by um, it is harder and harder to get access to those data uh, or commercial commercial databases, right? What is your um, what is your view regarding data sharing in that context? Well, that's, that's a really good point. The first thing I'd, I'd say is I I think that the prospective protocol development and uh, registration one of the issues of that which we would also be looking at is what new data would be necessary to answer the question. I, I, and I actually think one of the outcomes of of a prospective triangulation of evidence would be to say what are the crucial data that should be um, should be actually generated and uh, I mean one thing I think is a problem in epidemiology is that it's just so you know so easy you can get anyone can get UK live out of data and it's so easy to you know, produce things from that that we're that we, it's going to be it's going to be the tail paid by the dog in this case, but in that, in that we're actually doing things because the data are available, not because those are the first the key questions and these are things we want to answer. And so I, and I think in epidemiological training, I don't know how it is uh, here, but in many places, I think epidemiological training no longer hardly cut people 
different fields of work on how you actually collect data, data collection. So I think so I think there's a, there's a downside to um, you know to, to data. Well, it's not it's not a downside to data access itself, but but there can be a, an unintended consequence of moving us away from actually obtaining data for particular questions which relate. Um, uh, to that data, and then I mean, and obviously there's, a, there's ways of potentially gaming uh, data uh, um, systems. That, you know, access for some is can be if it's very costly, or, or you know, there are committees that might decide that they don't make the data accessible. And most obviously, uh, if the commercial data uh, is owned, you know, it's obviously commercially owned, but often it's, will not be made available. It's rather like the um, the public and private uh, competitors in the human genome programming and you know, sequencing race, where it was clear that the public, the private group, were just using the publicly available data, uh, were not making their data um, uh, uh, available. And um, uh, so much you know, research in the sort of pharmaceutical sphere is that pre competitive, but that, and then it's sort of pre competitive combined with. Uh, internal data which are protected and, uh, and, and not shared. So I, I agree with you that uh, in 1994, it sounded great just to demand increased access to data, but it's, 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 there are many issues around. Um, 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 but I'm, I'm not in methodology, so you know, I'm looking at this more as a reader of the epidemiological literature. So, if I have to look at the, the topic, say the vitamin E example, I would rather read the exhaustive analysis that convey the robustness of the finding in all possible manner, rather than know what you thought at the beginning when you designed the study. So the pre-registration gives a lot of weight on the view of the investigator, why am I doing this? Maybe interesting, but I would rather see the full spectrum of results. I don't know what you think about this, a sort of alternative or complementary approach that require that each paper. So what what does it take to make it go away to make that association go away in this day? So so first I, I won't I don't envisage this to be usually or if ever some sort of individual activity. So I think that the the, the, um, the way that certainly that we are thinking of moving ahead with this is to act, is to convene uh, you know groups. Uh, for uh, protocol uh, development, so mixtures of content experts, methodologists, but um, uh, selected in the, uh, selected in that way, that uh, that all the, the all the findings and the, and the results, etc., will be published in such a way as allow secondary um, secondary analysis that, that you can then run your sensitivity analyses and try to find out. Uh, what can make the, uh, the findings go away? So I, I, mean, I don't see it as a, I don't see it as sort of an alternative to a sort of deep analysis. I'd see that in the I'd see it as a, as a very major undertaking where the using different domains uh, you would the, 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 there would be you know complete uh, complete analysis and complete transparency and reporting and availability of the outputs in ways that allows other people to um, Play with it. Thanks. So, uh, your, you, you mentioned three very important things open access data, open source work, and protocol pre registration. I agree that all of them are good, but I think I disagree on their relative importance. Um, because for the protocol registration, as you said, it's easy to, it would be very easy to gain the system unless we have a very different system. And the worst offenders are probably the ones who have private access to the data. Those are probably the ones in which is harder to police and also are the ones who can actually look at the data first without anyone checking. So I would put much more emphasis on the open access data, open source code, and then whether the, and whether the protocol is pre-registered or not, 
uh, well, it's not that important because everyone else will be able to look at those data and will be able to see whether the protocol you are coming up with is some very specific thing that you are using because it's the only way that you can get the result that you want. So it will be self-police if the question is important enough by people accessing the data. So I, that is where I really put the emphasis, not, not a, having open access data, open source code, and a protocol, which would be the protocol of a target trial, which comes with the paper and allows you to see what is happening. And, and the reason why I think this is important and not just a difference in opinion is because I am concerned that in the future, if something, if someone is not pre-registered, it would be considered valid. It would, it would not be considered as valid scientific inference. And in fact, that's what we have already seen that happens with some industry groups that are the ones that are most, uh, that are pushing for, for, for pre-registration of protocols so that anything else that comes afterwards uh, is not valid because it wasn't pre-raised. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I agree. I obviously agree with you about uh, open access of data. That's the thing that I have, approaching 30 years, been fairly passionate about and put into practice in studies I've run. So, so, so to me, that is absolutely, that is the most important. I, I agree. Uh, I guess, I, I'm, I'm thinking that the, the protocol development would be, um, would be done in a way um, where where it is transparent uh, how that's done. You know, so, so in a way, it's, it's, it's documented you know, that, that that becomes transparent. I, I certainly don't think that one's going to um, uh, one's going to sort of disregard uh, other problems. Um, you know, discovery. Uh, I, I think that you know that, that things do things you know do come out of data, and, and uh, I think you know data mining. That, I think I think I think rather bizarrely, perhaps, things where things something wrong. No, but I, mean, I think that um, um, hypothesis free uh, data analysis uh, can uh, contribute to identifying. Uh, you know, the actual causal effect, but, um, and I, I, but I think you can. I think you can actually pre-specify. Uh, you know, I think you can even uh, pre-specify how you would carry out such, uh, such hypothesis um, three approaches. So um, I, I don't think we necessarily disagree in the, in the actual order of, uh, of importance. I, I think there's. I think there's not been as much effort put into thinking about what's the best way of going about. Protocol development and then integration, and I think they need to be. As I said, I think they, they, I think they should then be open and um, uh, and open to um, community peer review, uh, and and that, that uh, community peer review uh, could lead to you know specifying another analysis precisely. I think that, that would be part of the activity. I mean, I think I think this could be a sort of um, this could be a, a way into um, uh, extending the uh, remit and domain of data science. But I, but I, I mean, again, if you're not quite there, I have to know your uh, opinion on uh, the, the data that's being gained by for profit uh, uh, groups. We, we have time for uh, one last question from here or from the online audience if there's some, something. In the chat, we can take it. If not, nothing in the chat now, but I'll put it up on the chat. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you.